Army Pathfinder team has one basic mission, to furnish navigational guidance to Army aircraft in tactical operations. Through the skill and daring of Pathfinders, helicopters can be guided to points behind enemy lines in surprise assaults on tactical objectives. Pathfinders also prepare and operate landing zones where fixed-wing aircraft swiftly follow up with supplies and reinforcements and drop zones for resupply. Thus, swift mobility and tactical surprise will follow the footsteps of the trained and resourceful Pathfinder team. Let's see exactly how a Pathfinder team functions, starting with a unit commander's warning order. Here, the Pathfinder team leader learns the nature of the mission, date and time, the type of aircraft to be used, and the units which will be involved in the operation. On the basis of this information, the Pathfinder leader gives an initial briefing to his team so they can begin their preliminary preparations. When the operations order containing the complete details of the mission is received, the Pathfinder leader can complete his plans. The entire team, which now includes all personnel who have been attached for this mission, is given a thorough briefing so that each man will understand the nature of the mission and the part he will play in it. Now, this bridge is the main objective of the assault troops. And this area off to the east has been designated the landing zone. Since there will be four flights of helicopters in each serial, we will set up and operate four landing sites. This will be landing site green to the west of the stretch of wood. This will be yellow, here in this clearing along the bank of the stream. Blue will be over here in this wheat field. And black will be here at the base of this hill. The control center will be located on this knoll beside the wheat field. And the flight release point will be over here on the end of this ridge. Now each individual is assigned his specific duties, the attached personnel as well as the pathfinders. Three men will operate the flight release point. The team leader and four others will be stationed at the control center. And each landing site will be set up and operated by a three-man party. Pathfinders may be delivered to the designated area by landing in helicopters or fixed wing planes. They may also be delivered by parachute and under certain tactical situations by ground vehicles and amphibious craft. In this operation, the team will be delivered by helicopter. If time permits, a rehearsal of the entire operation is conducted. It is held on terrain which is as similar as possible to the terrain of the actual operation. All equipment to be utilized is employed. After a final inspection has been made to make sure that all necessary equipment is present and in order, the pathfinders and attached personnel load the helicopters which will transport them to the landing zone. and the first phase of the air mobile assault gets underway. If the objective area has been subjected to nuclear attack, the pathfinders will be expected to survey the route in order to report any radiation hazards. 
When the team is transported directly to the landing zone by helicopter, the men will be divided up so that each aircraft will have to make as few landings as possible. One helicopter will land first at the location selected for the flight release point. Since this is the location at which all subsequent flights will be released to find their designated landing sites, it must be a terrain feature which can easily be recognized. When the men who will operate the flight release point have unloaded, the helicopter continues on to the location which has been selected for the control center. Here, it lets out the pathfinders who will operate this installation. The control center party also checks immediately to make sure that its area is free from any radiation hazard. Assured of this, the takeoff signal is given. Each party carries with it all the equipment it will need to operate its own installation. Meanwhile, the other helicopter is landing the pathfinders who will operate the various landing sites. By landing the pathfinders directly on the area selected for each landing site, much time is saved, and the assault troops can follow the pathfinders at a closer interval. Sometimes there may be enemy activity in the area selected. In such cases, an alternate landing site will be used and the control center will be notified as soon as communications have been established. The landing site party is delivered to the alternate site with little or no interruption in the Pathfinder schedule. Once on the ground, the landing site party immediately starts to prepare the site for use. One man makes sure there is no radiation hazard and selects the locations where the helicopters will land. Another marks these individual landing positions with numbered colored panels so that each pilot in a flight will know exactly where he is expected to land his aircraft. And the third prepares the ground-to-ground -ground radio, which will be used to communicate between the site and the control center. Obstacles to landing, which cannot be cut down or removed, are marked with red panels. While the landing sites are being prepared, the control center also is being readied for operation. One man readies the short-range ground-to-ground radio to net with the individual landing sites. The Pathfinder team leader prepares his ground-to-air radio so that he can communicate with the incoming aircraft. Another prepares the long-range ground-to-ground radio, which will enable the control center to communicate with higher headquarters. And still others are busy erecting the ground plane antenna, which can be used to increase the range of the radio sets at this installation. After the equipment is ready for use, all pertinent information is collected in a log. Enemy activity, radiological readings, everything which is necessary is recorded. Wind northwest at 10. While the control center and the landing sites are being prepared, the flight release point also is being established. A homing beacon has been set up to guide the incoming aircraft to the area. A prearranged visual signal, usually a letter of the alphabet, has been laid out to mark the point. And a short-range ground-to-ground radio is ready to net with the control center and the landing sites. All of these installations within the landing zone are set up simultaneously 
usually within five to ten minutes, so that the attacking force will not lose the tremendous advantage of surprise. As the flight approaches the communication checkpoint, radio silence is broken by the serial leader of the approaching aircraft. Pathfinder, this is Alpha-1 at checkpoint, over. Alpha-1, this is Pathfinder. Enemy truck column at 385-732. Wind northwest at 10. Green, land 351. Yellow, land 343. Black, land alternate site 324. Blue, land 312. While the incoming serial is being given its landing instructions, the ground installations are alerted to its approach. Alpha-1 at checkpoint. Over. Alpha-1 at checkpoint. Out. Everyone must be prepared to accomplish his mission the moment the aircraft are sighted. Smoke may be used as a navigational aid at the flight release point if necessary. The object is to get the approaching aircraft onto the ground at the landing sites as quickly and safely as possible. Colored smoke may also be used to identify each landing site. However, since smoke gives away the position, it is generally used only on order of the team commander. Once over the landing site, the pilots pick out their assigned positions by noting the numbers on the panels, and the entire flight moves in and lands at the same time. When the troops are unloaded, they are directed to the initial assembly area, located in close proximity to the landing site. The aircraft are now prepared to take off again, and the control center is notified. The pilot gives the code name of the flight, as well as the fact that it is ready for takeoff. The control center identifies itself, and if everything is clear, gives the flight permission to take off. As soon as the first flight takes off, the landing site is ready to receive the next one. A well-trained Pathfinder team can control flights at one minute intervals. In this way, the assault force can rapidly be built up and the attack can be launched before the enemy can move his forces to oppose it. Pathfinders continue to operate the landing zone until all helicopter serials have unloaded. The Pathfinder team is not limited to daylight operations. Pathfinders are capable of operating this type of installation at night. At the landing sites, colored lanterns are used instead of panels to mark the individual landing positions. Lanterns are also used to indicate the direction of landing. And flashlights used in pairs are employed by the Pathfinders to transmit signals to the aircraft. At the flight release point, 
a rotating beacon is used in place of colored smoke as a navigational aid. And colored flares may be employed either here or at a landing site. Flares are used only when necessary. Like smoke, they can be seen by the enemy. The approaching aircraft are brought in quickly and safely by radio communication and by the arrangement of lights on the ground. With a well-trained Pathfinder team, a night operation can be conducted as efficiently as a daylight operation. Pathfinders are not limited to operating landing zones for helicopters. They also set up and operate landing zones for fixed wing aircraft in secured areas or enemy territory. In establishing a landing zone for fixed wing aircraft, one of the first things to be done is to determine the exact location of the runway. It must be long enough for all aircraft which will use the field. It must be level enough to allow aircraft to land and take off without danger. And if possible, it should be oriented so that landings and takeoffs can be made into the wind. As soon as the runway has been designated, the parking party marks it. Panels are staked down at 100 yard intervals to mark the edges. They are arranged in an open pattern to mark the start of the runway and in a closed pattern to mark the end of the runway. These markings will indicate to the pilot the proper direction for landing. At the same time the runway is being marked, it is also being improved. Obstacles to landing are removed. When they can't be removed, they are marked with red panels. Meanwhile, the taxiways also are being marked. The taxiways lead from the end of the runway to the parking area, then back to the start of the runway. The parking area is located far enough from the runway so that the runway can be kept clear of aircraft. Numbered panels are used to mark the unloading positions for each plane in the flight. While these facilities are being prepared for the arrival of the aircraft, the control center is also being set up. Since this installation will control all of the activities in the area, it is located in the position which provides maximum observation. It should be far enough from the runway so that engine noise will not interfere with radio communication. A Pathfinder team will be able to set up this type of landing zone in a very short time, from 10 to 30 minutes. The landing zone must be ready when the first flight of aircraft arrives. As with a helicopter operation, communications are established between the Pathfinder leader and flight leader. Navigational instructions are given all aircraft in the flight and the Pathfinder parking party is warned that a flight is approaching. The taxi men rush to receive the aircraft and the control center prepares to guide them in. The serial leader notifies the control center of the code name of his flight and that it is turning base. In reply, the control center states that the field is clear to land, to make left turn at taximen and to park at black one. Each plane in the flight lands as directed. 
As soon as it touches down, it is controlled by the parking party. The taxi men direct it onto the taxiway leading to the parking area. And the runway is clear for the following plane. At the parking area, each plane is directed to its designated parking point. As soon as a plane is unloaded, the control center is notified. The pilot gives the name of his flight and states that his plane is ready for departure. The control center notifies the pilot that he is cleared to taxi and gives him the direction and force of the wind. The aircraft is guided from the parking area to the taxiway, which leads back to the starting end of the runway. On reaching this point, each aircraft is held on the taxiway until it is cleared for takeoff by the control center. One by one, the planes are cleared for return to the home base and reloading. The pilot signals that he is clear, then taxis onto the runway to take off. Thus, the pathfinders control a continual succession of flights arriving and departing, operating by day, or by night. Clear lanterns in place of panels are used at night to mark the edges of the runway, and colored lanterns are used to mark both the approach end and the departure end. Flashlights are used to give hand and arm signals. To mark the taxiways in the parking area, other colored lanterns are used. Day or night then, the pathfinders are able to bring in planes carrying cargo or personnel. At the parking area, they are rapidly unloaded to clear the area for incoming aircraft. Then they move onto the runway and take off. Pathfinders may also be called upon to operate drop zones for the aerial delivery of personnel or supplies in either friendly or enemy territory. In setting up a drop zone, the first thing to be done is to locate and mark the T. For daylight operations, panels are used. The T is oriented so that a pilot can fly up the stem, starting his drop as he reaches the crossbar, and have all of his cargo or personnel fall within the limits of the drop zone beyond the T. Because a pilot cannot see the T while flying directly over it, other panels are put down on the flanks to serve as navigational aids. Other visual and electronic aids can be set up once the T has been established. At the same time, the control center is set up, usually at the junction of the stem and crossbar of the T. Assembly points are selected and marked according to a prearranged plan. When the incoming flight leader reaches the designated communication checkpoint on his course, he calls the control center for instructions. In this case, notifying the center that the flight of six others is at the checkpoint. Pathfinder replies, giving the vector, the drop point, and the elevation of the field. This specific guidance ensures a successful drop in daylight, fog, smoke or darkness. The flight leader takes the magnetic heading which has been given him and the other planes in the flight assume the proper formation for the drop.
When the lead aircraft comes into view, the team leader gives the pilot verbal instructions to guide him over the drop zone. Thus, the pilot may be told to steer right or left. Other planes in the formation follow the course set by the leader. He reports their approach on course. As the formation approaches the drop zone, the control center warns the pilot to stand by. As the first plane passes over the team, the control center calls for the drop, repeating three times the command to execute. The plane drops its cargo and heads back to its base. The second plane comes in on the same course, and as it passes over the T, it is given the same command. The plane drops its cargo and returns to its base. This continues until all the planes in the formation have made their drops. Then the recovery personnel move out and gather up the dropped cargo and transfer it to one of the assembly areas. Thus the pathfinders operate a drop zone during daylight. At night, the operation is very much the same. Either infrared or visible lights are used to mark the T as well as the flanks. A rotating beacon is placed as the first light in the stem of the T. And another rotating beacon is used to mark the end of the drop zone. As the planes come in then, they see the same pattern as in daylight. And they follow the same procedure in making their drops. These are the principal ways in which the Army Pathfinders are employed. to operate landing zones for rotary wing aircraft. To operate landing zones for fixed wing aircraft. And to operate drop zones for the parachute delivery of supplies or personnel. Pathfinders may be required to operate either in daylight or at night. As warfare becomes more fluid and combat units are required to operate over longer and longer distances, such modern units as the Pathfinders will be more and more in demand. The speed and efficiency with which Pathfinders operate may very well determine the success or failure of air mobile operations.